to begin our 930 segment, uh, the artist to fan relationship, our first conversation, it's going to explore how artists are leveraging their brand to enhance the artist fan relationships and reduce middlemen from managing their own ticketing to running fan clubs to offering VIP experiences. Want to invite our conver conversants, are they conversants? Yeah, you're the interviewer, they're conversants. Uh, to the stage, Mike Luba and also Heidi Vaccarano. Mike is the co-founder of Madison House. He's an artist management firm that represents some of the busiest touring bands in the United States. In addition to his current job overseeing the wildly popular TV and live show Yo Gabba Gabba, <laughs> he also continues to manage String Cheese Incident. Mike brings to this conversation a history of working with jam bands that have cultivated fan relationships and built out their own infrastructure to better serve their fans. Joining him is attorney Heidi Vaccarano from La Polt Law, an LA-based law firm that has an array of clients in music, film, television, merchandising, and the book publishing industries. Heidi will speak from the perspective of the indie rock band that is just getting started and has a lot of support. And Kristen Thompson, of course, will lead the conversation. Please give them a warm welcome. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, so, uh, as Jean mentioned, we're talking about the artist-fan relationship. And um, uh, just mentioning the graphics up here, um, what you're seeing is different pie charts based on the different conversations we're having in the next couple of days. And um, just, to, just because we have so little time, we also made a couple of individual slides for each um, artist or person represented. So you'll see something based on what Heidi told us in a second. Um, this just sort of give you some context here. But I wanted to actually start by asking Mike something, because um, I know you've been in the business of managing artists for how long? About 15 years, probably. Yeah. And so just based on what I understand about your, the, bands, the types of bands you've worked with, I have a sense that the artist-fan relationship has been a very important part of, the, of what you did for your artists. So tell us a little bit about how some of the bands you worked with really embraced that, the value of that, convert, that uh, relationship and what they did to actually cultivate it. Well, I, I think for us and for the bands we worked with, it, there was never any question about the fact that the relationship with the fans was, was the single most important thing. And literally every decision flowed from that. And as we started out, with a band like the String Cheese Incident who were playing little ski bars um, and Madison House, which was run out of a spare bedroom in Athens, Georgia. What, what happened was that anytime we tried to farm something out to a third party, it would get fucked up. Mm -hmm. And we then realized that we could, we could screw it up as bad as everyone else on our own and, and at least be accountable for it. <laughs> so we were able to you know, run down the hall and be like, hey, dipshit, the website doesn't work or, you know, and, and that expanded all the way out to, you know, Madison House this day has a, a travel agency. They ran their own label. We did our own ticketing. We booked. We managed. Um, but it was all 100% driven by the need to have the most direct pipeline to the fans mm -hmm. because that was, we would get the best feedback. We would get incredible market research mm -hmm. from the source and it, it informed everything. Right. Did, how did technology, uh, over the past, say, 10 to 12 years, how did you, um, you know, use technology to leverage that even more, you know? Well, it, it changed everything, because mm -hmm. 15 years ago, 12 years ago, it was right as, you know, when I, when I went to college, I have a clear memory of maybe sending in one e my first email, and it kind of being a really breakthrough kind of thing, and printing out reports on those crazy printers with the... So, and then in two years, all of a sudden, you were actually able to talk to people all over the, the real world in real time. And once that happened, the barrier, the barrier to entry for disseminating music, um, information, mm -hmm. selling tickets, mm -hmm. right. everything changed. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about ticketing in a second, but I thought I'd bring Heidi in here and ask you a question. Like, I know you work with a lot of different artists at various levels with yes. La Pote Law. Mm -hmm. but can you talk a bit about how some of the emerging bands, say, for example, I know label support is more difficult to get now, so what are some of the emerging bands doing to um, you know, compensate for that? You know, how, are they, you know, how are they approaching their fan relationships now? Well, I think it's very, really important that 
they spend a lot of time on that. Uh, one of our bands is really good about speaking directly to them and we're able to take their brand and see what would appeal to them. And so they hadn't taken advantage of the VIP experience. So we hooked them up with the company and one of the things that they did was start to do, um, this. we represent this band called Black Veil Breads and they're known for their war paint and their images. And so we t were able to sell these VIP packages where they would spend time with their fans and put the war paint onto them. And those sold out within seconds. And now they're doing headlining tours in Europe where fans that we had never thought we could reach are buying these packages. And they build from that each and every time. Mm. And what else does the band do to sort of you know, leverage its brand? Well, they also have a fan club where we, they're, they have um, a younger fan base that you know, is really savvy and they're taking photos and videos at these shows. So rather than try to take them down from YouTube, we actually um, have them uploaded to the fan club. And, instead of, and each time that they um, upload something, we give them points and they'll get gifts from the band or direct um, videos from each time from the band members or they get um, pre-releases as well. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever um, delve into, like, I mean, with the VIP experience, do you, are you able to um, sort of set aside a certain amount, amount of tickets or do you kind of do that on the, separately from the shows themselves, like the mechanics of the promotion of the show? Um, it's a little bit separate. We have a company that does do the ticketing as well. Obviously, everyone knows you can only take 10% for, for the band to sell on their own, and um, but you can do the VIP separate from the venues and from the ticketing. Mm -hmm. So we can either do 20 or we can do 500, depending on the level of the band. We like to keep it smaller so that it's not overwhelming and the fans are much more um, interactive with right. the band. Keep it special. Mm -hmm. So related to that, was the 10% rule in effect? Uh, was that one of the reasons that you started SCI ticketing, or was it something else? Um, in terms of it relating to the VIP experience well, specifically? Okay, maybe I should just back up and say, why, why did you guys start SCI ticketing? What was the, you know, what did you, what were you not getting from the, you know, existing structure that, you know? Well, we weren't getting tickets to sell. Yeah. <laughs> at a you weren't, price, getting, you at weren't a price getting the tickets you could sell directly to your fans. Yeah. The, the eureka moment was we realized that the technology now existed that you, we could, as a, you know, a bunch of hippies in Colorado could essentially provide a better service or a service that was viable for what the band needed at a price that we could set and then control mm -hmm. as, as, as well as actually then collect the data that we could use for, for other things. So, so we would take the band to go into strange places where it was important to be able to, if we had 10,000 kids coming, we had to be able to go to the cops and be, hey, guess what? 70% of them are coming from this way and 10% are coming from this way. And, but what happened for us, and I think for everyone, was just there's no real ability now to control what the ticket price the band wants to set and what it actually ends up at mm -hmm. by the time the consumer buys it. Right. And I think that's the scariest part and, and why everything is a little bit screwed up right yeah. now. Well, um, I was never really much of a, um, I didn't do a lot of following particular bands, but I've always been really impressed with how some of the jam bands have built around the shows, like all this ancillary stuff, and the fact that you guys have a travel agency is brilliant, you know. Oh, I'm going to six shows. Well, who's gonna help me with hotels? Tell, can you tell us a little about the travel agency part of it? Well, again, it was all about serving the, the fan, mm -hmm. whatever feedback the fans gave, and that was something that they said, look, if we are gonna go see multiple shows, it sure would be nice to know how to make it as easy as possible. So for us, the idea was to make it as frictionless, the experience as frictionless as possible. But it wasn't necessarily even a jam band specific mm -hmm. thing. We worked with uh, a girl named Amanda, Amanda Palmer who mm -hmm. ran the Dresden Dolls, who was super punk rock. And it was this, we found that it was the same ethos over and over and over again. And it wasn't necessarily scene specific. And people who like music want to have the, the easiest, best experience without feeling like they're getting ripped off as much as possible. And I think that's universal and crosses everything. Yeah, I agree. So I w thought I'd ask you, Heidi, um, you know, things have, I think it's fair to say, that, you know, there's, there's things changing all the time. And what do you see as things that are um, av available now for artists that can, um, to, to make the artist fan relationship even better? Like, do they spend more time actually doing conversations like Twitter, Twitter updates? Or is it more about making it a quality conversation? Um, 
you know, can you talk a bit about the choices that you make and what your bands are trying to spend their very minimum, a little, little yeah. bit amount of time doing? I think it's really hard when you want them to spend a lot on the creative side, but um, the fan, reaching the fan is the most important part. And I have a lot of um, fans who do, especially like the Backfell Brides, they'll go on and do um, like YouTubes or, and speak directly to, to the fan and have these sessions where they'll just, you know, I am with them all day, not all day, but you know, for sessions and it helps them decide how to um, uh, do the track list for their latest album. And I think that interaction really helped for them to reach the Billboard charts mm -hmm. on their first major label debut, mm -hmm. which is really rare. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like um, all this work being put into artist fan relationships, did you see um, it in the bottom line? I mean, where you see revenue coming in based on this relationship? Merchandise sales, VIP, fan club, is it all of it together? I see it more in the merchandising, the touring, and um, you know, parts of touring like the VIP and the fan clubs have really helped them stay you know, afloat in a time where the major, well, the label isn't giving you that tour support. I need to, you know, help pay for security. I need to help pay for gas. And the, these aren't things that the label's like, oh, here's a card, go pay for it. They're, they, it's our responsibility to handle. Hmm. Um, Mike, what do you see is, um, I mean, I know we've talked about how important the artist fan relationship is, but do you see the revenue streams for some of these bands changing over time, you know? the ratios amongst different revenue streams? Yeah, I, I think without a doubt. And, and I think you, you can take a, you look at a guy like Zach Brown, mm -hmm. who is, who again, after 10 years of working in, in clubs, crossed over into the mainstream and his gut instinct as a, as a artist of this generation is, he does this thing called the eat and greet where he goes out instead, he actually cooks a meal for his fans they built a whole ridiculous trailer that they take a full chef staff, and he's now brought it all the way out to the point where they actually, when he goes and plays his own show, they build these, these sky boxes on the side of the stage for 500 people, and they serve a seven course gourmet meal, while, and they come over and play, and it's absurd. And I, I think that's something that three years ago, four years ago, never would have even been in the realm of reality. And now this whole crew of kids are coming up, and it's almost expected that if you don't do that, you can't win. Hmm. And in terms of the financials, I, you know, I don't want to speak for Zach, but I'm sure at this point he's spending money hmm. to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he sees it as a lost leader to improve the experience, which then enables him to sell more records or go out and play arenas or do whatever else he needs. But it all started with the, the ethos of, I'm going to completely over-deliver musically and experientially for, for the fans. Do you feel like... Um Okay, this is kind of right there, the last question we have time for, but I thought I would just ask you to both to think about, you know, if you, you know, thinking about what it move, how it moves from here. You know, I feel like some artists, I've heard some say like, you know, I'm exhausted. I'm expected to do so much stuff, you know, whether it's social media or bookkeeping, you know, and the, everything in between and be creative. I'm wondering what you think about um, the artist's fan relationship in the context of the entire thing they have to do, does it still take precedence? I mean, is this the thing that they should be focusing on? And, and does technology make it easier to do that? Or does it make it crazier? You know, just the sort of feeling like, where, where are we moving, moving from here? For me, especially coming from, from the lawyer's perspective, it's educating my client about what these avenues and what these tools bring to them. A lot of my time, you know, once, when you approach an artist and tell them, please do this. It's, you have to give them the background and how that's going to affect their bottom line and what this is going to lead to. So a lot of my time is spent educating. And I hope that one day that, you know, that my artist does see why this is going to change their lives. And you have to work with an artist that understands their brand from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get them to do these things and to embrace technology. Not every artist does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's critical necessarily for the artist to get sucked into an, a non-ending Twitter, Facebook conversation with the fans. I think it's more about creating an environment where the fans know that there's some level of access and, and that the, the artist is paying attention and aware of what's going on. And then it's more about connecting the fans together so that they can build their own community. And, and then as you can pump music and goodies into it, they feel like that 
that it's a reciprocal relationship. But again, that's, it's not a particularly brand new idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look yep. back at KISS in 1972, mm -hmm. making lunchboxes and the KISS aren't. It's, the ideas were all laid out at the beginning of, of rock and roll. It's just a question of can you update them through technology to make it more effective. Yep. Thank you so much. All right, well, thanks so much for our first uh, conversation. Um, we're going to have Mike's actually going to stay and be on this next panel about um, ticketing and um, you know, what's going on in the post Live Nation Ticketmaster world. But I want uh, everyone to thank Heidi and Mike for this conversation. Thanks.